Hello and welcome everybody. So in this video we will continue what we did in the previous section. In the previous section we looked at an individual coefficient and we know how to estimate this already for a while and we thought about how to quantify the error in these estimates. So we first spoke about how can we quantify this error and then we turned that into a way to construct confidence intervals and another way to construct tests. And key was really to measure the error in the correct way and then the results about confidence intervals and tests were rather simple. And we'll continue this here, only now we will allow to consider more than one component at once. And that's important for a few reasons. So first, we cannot just repeat what we did in the previous section for all components, because then it turns into a multiple testing problems and these are difficult. We cannot use the same data and then try different tests on the same data without adjusting the significance levels. So that would be statistically not sound methodology. So instead, to get that right, if we use the data, we can only do one thing with it. And here we learn how to do tests which consider several components at once. And to go with it, we also will consider confidence regions. And because now it's not just one number which can be large or small, although the region is not an interval, but I will show you there are ellipses in R2 or ellipsoids in Rk if you have more than two coefficients. So that's what we're going to do. And the structure is very similar to the last chapter. So we will start with finding a way how to measure the distance between the estimate and the truth. So let's see how we do that. Okay, so my aim here is for us to explain a general framework which we can use to say which coefficients are we interested in. So beta, the coefficient vector, has components beta zero, which is the intercept, and then beta one up to beta p, which are the coefficients for the p inputs. And in the previous section, we just said we look at beta i by from 1 to p. So what we really needed down here was this number i, which tells us which coefficient. Now I want to allow to look at more than one coefficient at once, possibly all or possibly a subset. So I need to somehow say which subset. And I could just use a group of indices, but turns out there is a better way for the theory and also a way which allows slightly more general hypothesis in the test and slightly more general results for confidence regions. So what we are doing is we are considering a matrix K in R some number, I call that K times P plus one. And instead of beta, we consider K beta. And I just want to give a simple example. So if P is three, like in the stack loss data set, which we have already seen and we'll see again later in this section, then beta, if I write it as a column factor, is beta zero, beta one, beta two, beta three. And we can use this mechanism multiply by a matrix from the left easily to pick out, say, beta 1 and beta 2. And for that, the first observation is this k here, that's the size of the output. So k beta is in Rk. So if we want two coefficients selected, then we need two outputs. So k needs to be two. So we need a two by four matrix in this example. So k, we haven't spoken about what goes in, but there must be two rows, two columns. Okay, now if you think this through, it's rather easy. If we want to pick out beta 1, we can just write 0, 1, 0, 0 here. And if we multiply that, it's 0 times beta 0, 1 times beta 1, 0 times beta 2, and 0 times beta 3. So if we add that up, we get beta 1. And very similarly, if we do 0, 0, 1, 0, then we get beta 2. So then k beta would be beta 1, beta 2, just because all the other coefficients are multiplied with 0 so they disappear. Good. So that's a simple trick to pick out coefficients. And this trick can be used for slightly more general things. Namely, for example, if we want beta 1 and the average of beta 2 and 3, they just made that up. So say we want this, then we know what to do. Same example, namely beta 1, we have just learned. We would do that. And to get 1 half beta 2 plus 1 half beta 3, we would do that. And 
Similarly, if we are interested in the difference between coefficients, for example, if we want to test whether one coefficient is bigger than the other, also we can do that by plugging minuses in here. And I just want to mention one particularly important example. Sometimes you want to just ignore the intercept but have all the other coefficients. And in this case, k needs to be, of course, 1, 0, whatever, 1, 0, 0 is here. So it has it has once here, but no, I didn't draw that very cleverly because I said we don't want the intercept. So we have one column of zeros here. And then behind that, we have a diagonal of ones. So that would be an RP times E plus one matrix. And this matrix just drops the intercept and keeps all the rest. And we will later see that that's sometimes a useful thing to do, but let's not worry about this now. So we look at K beta where k beta typically is just a subset of the regression coefficients, but in general could be any group of linear combinations of the regression coefficients. How do we estimate this? And that is rather straightforward. Namely, we know beta hat is an estimator for beta. I just write they are approximately equal here. So if you want to estimate k beta, it is rather straightforward. We should be looking at k beta hat. And we will see in this section that is the right thing to do. K beta hat is close to K beta. Let's start this straight away. With what we know, we can work out immediately that K beta hat is an unbiased estimator for K beta. So how do we do that? We know that beta hat is normal distributed. And since it's unbiased, we know the mean must be the unknown beta. And we worked a bit, but not very hard to get the variance, and that's sigma squared x transpose x inverse. So that we have seen in the past. And now if we multiply this thing from the left with k, and we learn immediately the distribution of k beta hat, well, we know the rules. A normal distribution, if we multiply a matrix, then it stays normal distributed. And the mean is just multiplied by this matrix, so the mean is k beta. And the covariance matrix was slightly more interesting, namely that is multiplied from the left with the matrix, but also from the right with the transpose of the matrix. So if the old covariance, then K from the left and K transpose from the right. Good, and from this we see straight away K beta hat is an unbiased estimator of K beta because here is the expectation and the expectation equals K beta. So that's a useful thing to know. Now, the question is, how can we measure the distance between k beta hat, the thing we can see and compute from data, and k beta, which is a quantity we want to learn about, but which in actual applications is unknown. So that's the thing we want to make inference about. And as in the previous section, some care is needed here. So we want to measure for the distance. And well, naive ways of measuring the distance would be to just take the difference. We could do that, so that's a vector in Rk. And then because it's a vector and distance we think of more of a number, what we could do is we could use the norm of this vector. So that would be a reasonable first attempt of how we could measure the distance between the estimator and the truth. And it turns out that is not a good way for several reasons. And one of them is the distribution of this depends on sigma we don't know. So we will not be able to derive any tests or confidence intervals using that quantity because we will not be able to work out the distribution of this in a way which we can know just from data. It contains sigma squared and we have estimates for sigma squared but we don't know the true value. So as we did before, we need to divide by something which is also proportional to sigma squared. And it's, well, I said also proportional. It's proportional if I put a square here, if I do the squared distance. And it turns out I can divide by our estimator for sigma squared. If I divide by sigma hat squared, then both that is proportional to sigma squared and that is proportional to sigma squared. So the ratio has a distribution which does not depend on sigma squared. So that solves this problem, but the other problem is a bit more subtle. It turns out if we look at the distribution of beta hat, well, we have subtracted the mean, the mean, so the difference is centered, but there is this covariance matrix here. And that covariance matrix, that means the fluctuations in some directions are stronger than in other directions. Let's say here's the truth, k beta. 
And then k beta hat is distributed around that in some way. And it could be that it is a normal distribution where the level sets look like this, so that it I just draw level sets of the normal distribution. The typical values of k beta hat could be here or there or there or there, but they would be extremely unlikely to be here or there, despite the fact that that this and that kind of is the same distance. So we should take this structure into account, and the way to do that is to change the norm we use here to measure the distance between two vectors a bit. And what we need is, I define that in a second, so we need a way to measure the length of the vector which takes this covariance into account. And if we have a covariance matrix Q, the way we can do that is X transpose Q inverse X. And first, if we think about dimensions, so say X is in RK and Q is a K by K matrix, then X we can take to be a K times one vector and then X transpose we can take to be a one times K vector and Q inverse is K by K. So that all works out. So that thing here is a number. So technically it's a one by one matrix, but one by one matrices are very similar to numbers. Good, so that's a number, and if you know enough linear algebra that you have learned the definition of a norm, then you can check that satisfies the definition. And there's a mistake. We can either write a square here or a square root on the right hand side. So that's the way we measure distances here. And the question is now just what is our Q? And it turns out we need that matrix here. So what we are going to do is we use this for Q equals K X transpose X inverse K transpose. Good. So that's the way to measure distances. And that has several advantages. So first, we can compute that from data. Well, we don't know K beta, but otherwise we can compute that from data. So we know that matrix and we know sigma hat squared. And we need to make a tiny change and then we can characterize the distribution of this. Namely, it turns out we should write K here. K is the number of rows in the matrix capital K. So this K, for this example, that would be two. And once we have done that, I will show you this quantity follows what's called an F distribution. So we can know the distribution of this, which we will need to construct tests and confidence intervals. So that's what we need. We can compute it from data and we know the distribution if we have this prefactor. Okay, so first definition. So X is F distributed and that has two integer parameters, nu1 and nu2. That's the F distribution with nu1 and nu2 degrees of freedom. If and only if X can be written as S1 over nu1 divided by S2 over nu2, where oh, there are three conditions. S1, the numerator must be chi-squared distributed with nu1 degrees of freedom. S2 must be chi-squared distributed with nu2 degrees of freedom. And S1 and S2 must be independent. That's what makes a F distribution. And that is something like the square of a T distribution. Okay, so claim is this quantity, this distance measure, which I want now to call F, this one here. The claim is this is F distributed. Let me just copy that. So claim is this thing is F distributed and we need to say the numbers of degrees of freedom. And it's k for the numerator and n minus p minus 1 for the denominator. And the proof is very nearly easy, except we need to redo part of what we did when we proved Cochran's theorem. So let's have a look. So the numerator first is k beta hat minus k beta squared. And then this q norm, let's say that thing here we define to be q. So that thing is the first thing we can take the k out. So it's k beta hat minus beta q norm. And beta hat minus beta we have seen is x transpose x inverse x transpose epsilon. That's from an earlier lecture. We have that. And now the q norm, the definition was, let me just write that up here as a reminder. So x q norm was x transpose q inverse x. 
So that's not difficult, it's just a bit lengthy. Let's leave lots of space. So first X transpose, that is epsilon transpose, X, X transpose, X inverse. I don't need the transpose because that's symmetric, K transpose. Then Q inverse, we can expand that later if needed. And then K, X transpose, X inverse, X transpose, epsilon. Good, so we have this. And I want to call the matrix in the middle, so that very long expression, dup, 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 this one, I want to call R. So epsilon transpose, R epsilon. Good. So that was the first step. It's a quadratic form with the noise, the error, epsilon as the vector. Now, let me just recall that. R is... Epsilon transpose X, X transpose X inverse, K transpose Q inverse, K X transpose X inverse, X transpose. That is R. Good. And now comes a slightly annoying but not difficult bit. The claim is R squared equals R, which means R is idempotent. And I'll show you. So we just need to not get confused with all this stuff. So R is X, X transpose X inverse, K transpose Q inverse, K X transpose X inverse, X transpose. And then I write another R, so it's still X, X transpose X inverse, K transpose Q inverse, and I run out of space, K X transpose X inverse, X transpose. So that's R squared. And now we just need to just look at that two spot terms we can cancel. And here's something we can cancel. X transpose X inverse times X transpose X goes away. Good, so let's wipe that out. So we have this. Now we need to remember what Q was. Q is K X transpose X inverse K transpose. So if you look at that here, you see that also goes away because K X transpose X inverse K transpose is Q. Here's a Q inverse, Q inverse times Q is identity. So we have this. And the remaining expression we need to look at again. If you compare term by term with the definition of R, you see that actually equals R. So that equals R. Okay, so that was not hard. Just need to go through these steps. And now comes the part where we would really need the full version of Cochran's theorem, or rather, I should maybe not have proved the simplified version for you. Namely, if you think back in Cochran's theorem, we proved epsilon transpose H epsilon is chi-squared distributed with P plus one degrees of freedom. And if you go back to that proof, and look how we proved that. We diagonalized the matrix, and then we argued in the new matrix, epsilon is still standard normal distributed, and H suddenly is diagonal with ones and zeros on the diagonal, and that picks out just some sums of squares of standard normal distributed random variables. Then it must be chi-squared distributed, and then we need to just count how many, and that was the rank of H. And you should actually go and reread this proof and check this, because in this proof we use no other property of H except that it's idempotent. So exactly the same proof will work with R, which is also idempotent. So what we get is epsilon transpose R epsilon is also chi-squared distributed. And the only question is, what's the number of degrees of freedom? So that I explained earlier must be the rank of R, number of linearly independent columns. And that's something we would need to work out. And I didn't do that in the notes and I will also not explain that here because if you don't have enough linear algebra that is annoying to do. But you kind of, the way I think about it is you need to go through from the right to the left and look for bottlenecks in here. So then the question really is if you play with the inputs here, so think of this, that's in n by n matrix. So you have input vectors here you can play with. And the question is then, if you apply that, you get an output vector, and what's the dimension of the output vector space you can reach? And if somewhere in here is some one-dimensional thing, then you will, well, from here you have only one variable you can play with, so that transforms it, but you have only a chance of getting a one-dimensional output vector. 
So that's at least an upper bound. And this thing here, that's a k by k matrix. So out here is n. And k is small. k is like one or two or three number of coefficients we look at. So in here you can play with the inputs, but after you have mapped it through the k by k matrix, you have a k dimensional vector at this point, and then you apply a matrix which brings it back to n dimensional space. So from that is clear, since there are only k directions you can play with here, you can at most get a k dimensional subspace in that n dimensional space. So it's clear it is at most k c rank. And again, I'm not doing a formal proof, but it turns out in the cases we are interested in, that is actually k. And for that, we need x transpose x is invertible. And now I haven't spoken about this yet, but obviously we also need that q is invertible. And that just means that has rank k, otherwise we could not do the inverse here. And it turns out that is enough if you fight your way through that really carefully. So that's chi-squared distributed, we can see immediately, and I leave out the full proof for showing you it's with k degrees of freedom. Good, so we have this, that's the numerator of f, that quantity distance squared is epsilon transpose long matrix epsilon, the matrix we checked is idempotent, so we know it must be chi-squared distributed, and I just told you it has k degrees of freedom. Numerator is chi-squared distributed, is really good for getting an f-distribution. And now you see where this k here comes from, namely for the f-distribution we need for the numerator s1 over k, other, the degrees of freedom. So this k here in the theory we will write here. And sigma hat squared, we have seen before, if we multiply with n minus p minus 1 and then divide by n minus p minus 1, then this first bit is also chi squared distributed. And the thing I have forgotten here now is the sigma squared. So we need to add this in. So we need a 1 over sigma squared here and a 1 over sigma squared here to make that true. Then that is now really chi squared distributed when I wrote this. I forgot the 1 over sigma squared. And for the previous result, we also need this, but we can have the sigma squared here because they cancel. I didn't change the value of f when I rewrote it like that. Good, so we are nearly there for an f distribution. We have chi squared over degrees of freedom and chi squared over degrees of freedom. We just need independence. And that we have already done because I showed you once and for all in the previous section, beta hat and sigma hat squared are independent. So any function of beta hat is independent of any function of sigma hat squared. Do that, we just get with the lemma from the previous section. Good, and that's us done. Now we have this function f, I messed up the formula a bit, but you have a nice and tidy version in the notes. That quantity is f distributed. And, well, we'll use this to good effect in the next two subsections. Good, so this function f, which we just considered, that is the function we will use to quantify how close or far away is the unknown truth from the estimate we can see. And like in the previous section, we can now use this with relatively low effort to construct confidence regions and hypothesis tests. And we'll start in the next video with confidence regions. So see you in the next video.